Hi, I'm Bob Stewart. I'm principal of a small firm, Historical Technologies, and I do contract work in recording uh, industrial uh, archaeology artifacts, and I am currently a trustee of the Noble and Cooley Institute for Historical Preservation. I'm going to talk about railroad interlockings, particularly focusing on 75th Street interlocking in Chicago. The work that we did on railroad interlocking plants primarily was with the 75th Street Chicago interlocking. This was back in 1998 and it was the day after they switched from a manual operation of actuating semaphores, switches, derails to an electronic computerized one. It's rather interesting that the original interlocking plant, the mechanical plant, covered an area of about a half mile square. Some of those pipes were a quarter mile long and extended in both directions, north, south, east, west, from the central tower. It was replaced by something that sort of looked like a large porta potty. And in any event, just to clarify, and I'm sure most of our SIA people know what an interlocking is, but in railroad parlance, it's a collection, an interlocking is a collection of signal switching devices that prevent incompatible or dangerous movements through a layer of tracks. Simply put, you don't want a, a northbound and southbound train on the same track heading toward each other. And an interlocking is the primary way of avoiding crashes and maintaining a, a safe operation. Now the track plan could include junctions, crossings, hump yards, movable bridges, signaling appliances, switches, derailers, and tracks. And this actually dates back, the first interlocking, dates back to 1856 when John Saxby in England obtained a British patent for interlocking switches. This was a fairly successful device. It came to the United States about 25 years later, and the first interlocking was at Dispute and Dubal Junction on the New York Central and Hudson River Railway in 1875. Of course, the Americans had to develop their own technique and technology for interlocking, and they, Susie and Buchanan, who were superintendents of the uh, New York Central, developed a mechanism that was not at all successful commercially and or technologically. And their ideas and company was acquired by Union Switch in 1882. Now. There are other methods of actuating interlockings other than mechanical. This is the shell tower. And I noticed uh, Marty Stupich was one of the participants here. And uh, Marty did the photography on this. I did the drawings of the shell tower. This tower is located where the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad branches off from the Pennsylvania in New Rochelle, New York. One, uh, the New York, New Haven and Hartford going into Grand Central and the old Pensy going down in through the uh, East River tunnels to the old, well, to Penn Station. This is a hydro-pneumatic 
operated station, but I just want to show it as a, an alternate to the mechanical station, which we're going to focus on. This is a picture that was taken back in 1968 by Steve Brown of the 75th Street Interlocking Tower in Chicago. At that time, it was a, fairly, uh, a very active tower, Pennsylvania Railroad, several other railroads, which we'll discuss, used this, this crossing at 75th Street. The plant at 75th Street was built in 1894, as, as near as I was able to determine by union switch and signal. It is a 132 lever frame. Now this, sometimes these frames were called Saxby Farmer frames. Saxby and Farmer did have a, a company. And so you will sometimes hear the frames referred to as a farmer frame. But this ran from 1894 until 1997. And we got there the first day that it went electronic. So everything was in place. None of the pipes had been cut. They'd been disconnected, but nothing had been cut or removed. It was one of the last that used manually operated pipelines to actuate some switches, signals, and derails. As we'll see, and as I, one of my references will show, it took considerable muscle to actuate the Armstrong levers which could actuate pipes up to a quarter mile in length. It took a lot of elbow grease and it took a lot of petroleum grease to keep this system operating. This is a track diagram that dated back to 1930 when the Pensy was using this crossing along with several other railroads. Here's the crossing in 1966, the Baltimore and Ohio, Pennsylvania Railroad Belt Railway of Chicago and the Wabash used the crossing as well as the commuter trains. It is, today, there's still about a hundred trains a day that go through this crossing. Many of them are commuter, commuter trains uh, on the Metro system. Here's a picture of the tower in 1997, the day after it was taken half the service, but it was mechanical to the very end. This is the control room. It's where the strong arm levers actuated the semaphores, dwarf signals, derails, and switches in this interlocking. Now, the way it worked is very interesting. That was one of the things that we covered. When one of these levers was pulled, it would actuate a bar that moved across the frame, the locking frame. Now, these bars had little dogs on them, and I'll show you a close-up of that in a few minutes. These dogs were set so that they could, at a 45 degree angle, match with a bar running in this direction and move it. And when that happened, by having dogs on these frame bars, you could lock out any number of levers or any one or two or three or four that would keep you from putting any kind of train on the same track, going in as opposite direction. It would integrate your semaphores with ability to, to uh, pass. And um, I thought it was a, a very clever way of pre-computer doing business. It took a lot of grease to keep this thing going. Actually, what I look at it as is a big computer that is about a half mile 
in length and a half mile in width. Here's a picture of the, some of the dogs that you would see on on these bars. So you know, if a, if a bar would would be moved, it would prevent or move one of these other crossbars from moving. And they varied. The dogs varied in size and shape. So the locking dogs are shown to the left, and these are the, they are the raised metal parts. Now, this is a, an interesting picture here. It, this was taken from the tower, and it uh, runs, this pipeline runs about a quarter mile up to some semaphores and switches that are about a quarter mile away. These pipes are one inch in diameter and are sustained or held up by a series of rollers along the way. But you can picture in your own mind the amount of mechanical advantage that you would need from actuating a four foot lever in the uh, tower and moving a quarter mile of pipe, even if it is only a few inches, to actuate a switch a quarter mile away. And this is a method of where, how pipes were passed under the tracks. Let's see. Now you got pipes that are that long in the summertime and in the wintertime, you're going to have expansion. And this is a little compensator. As this pipe here would expand, it would drive this bell crank up upwards, moving this one and dragging this pipe, which is the other way, bringing it down closer. So expansion on this side would, would bring this one and compensate for the expansion of that pipe. They were several compensators used all throughout that system. It was unusual too at 75th Street in that most corner turns on these mechanical interlockings used bell cranks to turn corners, but not so at 75th Street. They had a rather elaborate scheme for actuating pipes around a 90 degree bend. Again, it took a lot of grease and a lot of maintenance to keep this system functional. This is a close-up of a typical pipe carrier. Now, to see the interlocking in action, you can check out this on YouTube. There's a 46-minute video that shows the interlocking in action. Most of it is probably favored by rail fans. In other words, 46 minutes is probably 10 minutes of the interlocking in operation, and the rest of the time is trains and freight trains going through the crossing. I've indicated here, if you do write that down, I've indicated here when, when the interlocking sections show up at seven minutes and 39 seconds, 12 minutes, 32 seconds, and uh, 14 minutes. And uh, I encourage rail buffs to watch the whole 46 minutes, but for the rest of us, I think we'll focus on the interlocking sections. Now, I have come up with an idea. <laughs> The total area covered by the plant, as I mentioned, is about a half of a square mile. But one way of looking at this whole plant is as a large analog computer based on Boolean algebra. That is, and, or, or not logic. Now, my Boolean algebra is kind of rusty, but I did Google it, and there's a, some excellent instructional videos on Boolean algebra. I doubt very much that Saxby and Farmer used Boolean algebra in their invention, but it would be interesting to take a look at this and look at this plant 
as it was designed as a mechanical exercise. Actually, I did a little experimenting around with the Boolean and it lends itself very nicely to some ladder logic and some circuitry that is used in conventional computers today. Another interesting factoid was uh, when we, the SIA did its Panama trip, we got down into the Gatun locks and were allowed to go into the lock house. And underneath the table, there's a table that duplicates everything going on in the locks, which locks are open, signals and so forth. And underneath that is a big mechanical interlocking system made of brass instead of steel. And that is what is used to control the lock gates. Uh, we talked to an operator. He claimed that, uh, of course, the question was, well, why haven't you gone to computers? I and mean, this was around 19, the year 2000. Why haven't you gone to computers to run this? Well, the operator claimed that because there were many lightning strikes in the area, that the engineers believed that a mechanical system was far more reliable than anything that was computerized. So that, in brief, is the story of the 75th Street interlocking, and um, I guess we're at question time.